You can start now. Dr. Muir, you can start now. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the executive lecture series at William Patterson University. It is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Sunil Roberts, who is a global executive with over 25 years experience in the area of corporate communication and management in general. He currently is uh, uh, heading a division in marketing in a division in Tata Consultancy Services, and he has extensive experience in other corporate spheres, including uh, in Oracle and elsewhere. Much before he became a corporate executive, he was a student in the city of Hyderabad in India, which is where I met him. So it has been a delight for me to watch him grow into uh, this extraordinary position as a communicator and a leader. Mr. Robert is also a member of the Toastmasters International Club, and we hope that he will be facilitating the entry of William Patterson University into the world of Toastmasters at some point in the future. Mr. Robert will be speaking to us on crisis management in a social media world, and I really look forward to learning from him, uh, as I hope do all of you. Please feel free to engage him with as many questions as possible, but I request you to hold your questions till the end and to use the mics so that our online audience, which is considerable, uh, will be able to uh, hear your question and participate in some way in the discussion. So without further ado, Sunil Robert, give him a hand, please. Check. Thank you, Professor Raza, for that warm and wonderful introduction. My name, my first name is Sunil, and it means sunshine. And uh, I'm hoping in some way my name will liven up your mood, considering the weather that we have outside. and. Uh, I hope to also follow the number one public speaking rule or teaching rule, which is try and be brief. Because then, if you can't earn your audience's respect, at least you would have earned their gratitude. <laughs> so although Professor Raza indicated to me that I could go up to 35, 40 minutes, I intend keeping it much shorter, so we have a fair amount of time for interaction. But sometimes, in the flow, speakers tend to just get swept away, and that's when you could potentially give me some visual cues as to how you're doing. So I want to get started. How are you today, this evening? Good? Hopefully the weather would not uh, deter us. The reason I chose this topic when all hell breaks loose is because there is, in the business world, almost a, a kind of an eggshell scenario where most executives are almost dreading every day as to what crisis might unfold from whatever quarters unexpected most times. So in marketing, as somebody who are supposedly the brand custodians of the brands that we represent, we as marketing communicators are always in the front line of activity whenever a crisis breaks out. You just look at the business newspapers every day, you'd see some brand or the other facing some bit of a crisis or the other. So my uh, session today is called, When All Hell Breaks Loose, how do you kind of manage? How do you react? What are some of the best practices that I could advise? And more importantly, towards the end of the session, I want to spend a few minutes talking to you about individual young upcoming professionals as to what it might mean to you on an individual level not just as uh, marketing or communication professionals. I've had the, I wouldn't call the joy of managing crisis because that would be as if I'm looking around for 
crisis to go and manage. I had the misfortune or the experience of having managed a couple of fairly complex crises in my journey as a brand custodian. The first one happened when I worked in a company which, and, and I'll share a little bit of the background here, was a Citigroup company. Now Citigroup as, uh, or Citibank, as most of you would know, had multiple venture capital companies invested all over the world, and the company that I've worked for happened to be one of them. So in some way, they were our parent, we were the child company, and we were doing some interesting work in India. We were India's first product software company. So if you are, any of you are following the technology space, Indian companies have suddenly come upon the global scene, and mostly they were known for outsourcing, helping big banks, helping big airline companies, helping big retail companies in the United States change their technology, and so Indians became very synonymous with outsourcing and projects and so on and so forth. But we were slightly different. Our company, the company that I for, worked for, created its first intellectual property, and we were called the, the first ever product company that came out of India. So in a sense, it had some bit of pride associated with it, some bit of uh, a cult-like uh, aura associated with us. We were very successful as a company as well. In a very short time of about eight, 10 years, 300 customers across 100 countries. US happened to be one of the countries that we were there, but we were pretty much all over the map. I mean, for example, we were in New Zealand. We were in the Middle East. We were in Africa. Africa, as, as you all know, uh, was considered to be a dark continent from a technology standpoint as well. But this company that I work for, iFlex, went into Africa as well. So very successful. The senior leaders were based in not far from here on Park Avenue. And uh, we had three different entities, one in Europe, one in Singapore, and one in, and much of our employee base was in India. A very interesting company to work for. In fact, if we came to your campus and 10 other companies came to your campus to work for, there would be competition among the children or the younger kids to see if they could be picked by us. Because while most people would come to America to work, our employees would go to really exotic countries. They would just travel the world. At that age, the world travel, the ability to go and impact banks and financial institutions around the world seemed like a very interesting appeal for many young people. So we really had a great thing going before the first crisis hit. The wedding crisis. I don't know if you follow the wedding ceremonies very intensely, but there is an almost like a, an outdated tradition when the priest or the pastor asks the church just before the important moment, is there anyone in this audience if there's an objection that these two should not be married? And then he pauses for a minute. To me, that's the most deafening, that's the most heartbreaking time in a wedding. You know, you know if, if that, that could be the moment where anything could fall apart, particularly if any of the two partners happen to have not so a blemishless track record. So iFlex as a company was on the threshold of being listed and we were gonna go public, which meant some of us could have potentially become rich because we were all employees and we all would get shares and we could have become rich. So this whole notion of India's first iFlex a product software company going public was very exciting for a lot of us. Employees, investors were very, very, very excited because India could finally have its own Oracle or finally could have its own Microsoft or what the future could have been. But very exciting times. We, were, we went through the whole process, we filed, and the books opened, we were, what, we were in what is known as a cooling period. And that's when all hell broke, broke loose for us. A big bank with, to whom we supplied software went to the media and said, I'm suing this company, this company makes nothing but garbage, this software doesn't work, and just pause there and think of all the implications that it could mean for us as employees, 
for potential investors who wanted to invest into this company, for the regulators. What do they do when, when somebody comes up and says, I'm suing this company. It has legal and compliance related implications. Then it also has implications on our competitors. The competitors were having a field day because, look, one of your own customers is saying that you suck. Here's the newspaper publication. It went to all our competitors. It went to all the competitors, took it to all our customers. In other words, we were not having a great day. At that point, the leader had a clear choice to make. Do you think this is a one-off crisis and then just move on? Because there are about 299 other customers who are happy, right? Or do you, do you go plow through this and, and pay a price? So it's really, like all crises, this was a, a very complex crisis with multiple implications for multiple stakeholders. So if you were the marketing manager, if you were the communications or the PR director of that company, how would your mind start, start playing out? How, what, what plans would you have to start thinking out? So I'd like you to hold that thought on the back of your mind. Do you attack and say, hey, this, this customer is a liar? And what message might that send to the 299 other customers? Should there be a legal or some kind of a misunderstanding between them? How would you treat? Do you go on the defensive? Do you, if you go on the defensive, what, what messages or mixed signals might that send? Right? But if you are defensive and you're silent, silent might mean admission to guilt. Yes or no? So what, what strategies would we formulate? And, and, and there's no clear yes or no or a straight path in such crises. And, and you will discover that in a short while. So this was really the first crisis that, that we waited. And another important aspect to bear in mind was when you are in the cooling period, or when you are in the quiet period, as the, the technical term is called, you cannot make advertisements. You cannot make public announcements. It's cooling time. It's silent time. You have to be silent. Those were the regulations issued by the stock exchanges with whom we signed up saying, we'll get listed in your stock exchanges, which means you're legally, contractually, and in many other ways bound. So it's like you are thrown into a fencing match with your hands tied. And the, the, the opponent is really taking swipes at you. So that was the first crisis I managed. I'll come back to the solutions in a minute, but let me paint the picture for what happened in the second story. The second story is even more interesting, because if the first one was bought, fought within India with some spillages into the United States and, and other competitors and customers in other parts of the world, much of our operating space was in India. But here, it really went global. In the second crisis, what happened was, remember I told you about how this company had three subsidiaries, one United States, one in Europe, and one in Singapore for Asia Pac. The Europe CEO was arrested. One morning, we just got a call into our Mumbai offices saying that our CEO is arrested. And that's when, again, as I said, all hell broke loose. What happened was the Netherlands government issued an extradition treaty to arrest our CEO who was based in London. Now usually extradition treaties are reserved for international traffickers, smugglers, and criminals of the worst order, not a, a high-flying jet-setting executive. But it was, and due to a series of unfortunate circumstances, the Crown Police in the United Kingdom arrested him and put him in a prison called the Brixton Prison for a few days. And because of that, for the next few days, there was huge furor in India. All the newspapers started taking the nationalistic stance, saying Indian executives are being targeted overseas. And then they just went jingoistic, they went ballistic, and they started attacking the British government, they started attacking the Dutch government, and they started playing this India versus the rest of the world. There was like cross-border protectionism at play. They're restricting our mobility as we go global. 
So that narrative was playing out in the media. But as a communicator, as a PR director, and, and our leadership team, our senior guys, our first priority was what? Whom do we need to get out of prison? Our, our, our senior leader is rotting away for a few, few days in prison. Not the best place to be if you are a CEO. So our, our goal, immediate goal, was to get the Dutch extradition request canceled. And as a, I'm a PR guy, I didn't study international affairs, I didn't study diplomacy, I didn't study, I didn't work for the United Nations. I had no idea about how these international deals and cross-border issues work out and play out. But anyway, with a lot of learning on the fly, our goal, primary goal, was to get the extradition request canceled and get our CEO out and then take on the Dutch government and figure out why that extradition request came and what happened. The, the second thing that, that was at stake was there were a few banks of ours, existing customers in the Netherlands, that had bought a lot of our software. So anything we might do as an attack strategy in Netherlands or in, in Amsterdam would impact the revenue from those customers and also potentially affect our global sales strategy. So think of that on the back of your mind. How our response to the Dutch extradition request would actually impact our go-to-market strategy, our business strategy, our, our ability to do future business in, in Europe. And then finally, we also had this whole competition playing out that we as a company violated certain visa-related, compliance-related issues, and therefore our brand was taken, uh, taking a beating. So if you were the PR person, or you were managing the social media, and you're seeing all these tweets and all these Facebook postings and all these LinkedIn announcements, what are some of the things that might play out in your mind as, as, as strategy? So I'll, I'll, I'll share what, what we did, combining these two and some of our, our learnings. The first thing in a, in a crisis is, you know, there are five stages of coping with grief, right? What is the first thing that people get into a mode of? A denial mode. This can't be happening to us. We are the number one product software company from India. We've, we've been number one for so many years. This can't be happening to us. How could it happen to us? Initially, that was uh, our reaction, but we, we knew that we didn't have time to waste over denial. We knew that if we had to get our narrative right, we have to be communicating, not let media, not let competitors, not let others take over the narrative. So the first rule in communication is, in a crisis particularly, you need to keep the communication lines and channels consistently open. There were times when we had no information to give to the media. I would go out, our senior leaders would go out and say, look, since we updated you 24 hours ago, the status quo remains the same. We do not have any fresh updates. So they will just take that sound bite and say, this is what has happened, this is what the company said, the company com continues to maintain this, this stance that there's no fresh information. What tends to happen is when there's no information, people go into a shut off mode and then everybody starts speculating. So the first thing we needed to do both in the time when a client went public and said our software sucks and then they wanted to sue us for an exorbitant amount of money to the time when our CEO was stuck and then this diplomatic crisis broke over, we guided the narrative. That's the first thing we should learn in crisis communication. First, acknowledge that there was an issue, and then we start talking. Now, watch me. I'm not saying admit to it. I'm not saying admit to the crisis. I'm saying acknowledge there is a crisis. And the big problem with corporations is they, they, they somehow feel the moment you acknowledge the issue, you're admitting to guilt. It is not so. Just, just acknowledge the issue and then, I, and, and I'll, I'll connect uh, on that part towards the end again. The moment you acknowledge, a whole lot of energy gets dissipated from the crisis. And I, I saw that in both those uh, narratives that played out. The second one was to really watch out, particularly in cross-communication across cultures. You know, the Dutch have 
a different culture. The Brits have a different culture. We who are playing out this narrative from India come from a different culture. We Indians tend to be a little emotional. And it should, you should have caught that by now. We put our heart, soul, and mind into everything. So when this, uh, uh, the customer scenario played out, our, our first reaction was, how could this bank, where 300 of our guys went and put their blood, sweat, and toil, could turn around and threaten to sue us? You know, it just takes one disgruntled client to spoil your story. Just one bad apple or one bad customer experience. So we knew that we had to acknowledge that these things happen. So when we started telling the story about the customer threatening to sue us as well as the diplomatic crisis, we started talking at multiple levels. The first thing we did was we really used the mass media well particularly in the second instance, because we, we didn't have the limitation of a silent period or a quiet period holding us back. In the first crisis, there was this legal silent time where we could not respond. And so the customer went on bad-mouthing us in the press. So we let it pass till the time the gates would be open for us to communicate. We waited, we bided our time. In the meantime, he ran out of ga gas, and then we, when we were able to tell our version, People really respected the fact that we held our patients and we were willing to work. And I'll tell you how you could get around some of these legal and complex compliance-related issues and skirting some of them and come up with other ways of communicating your same message using other customers who are not legally bound to, to speak on your behalf. So I'll, I'll talk a little about that towards the end. The last one, uh, the last couple of ones I wanted to tie Two, involving all the big guns and telling your track record and story was something that we really wanted to play up. Remember I told you we, were, we had 300 customers across 100 countries. We kept hammering that message right from the, our chairman to, to as someone as low as at my level. We just went to town with that narrative. Everybody had the same script. Everybody had the same message, uh, messaging book. Everybody had the same responses. So even if the message, the media tried to catch any one of us, the same story would play out, different levels, different voices. So our consistency in message, our ability to stick to our corporate track record, our success, really set us up high so that the, the world knew that if these guys are so successful, this must be an aberration. If these guys can go into countries where they don't even have telecommunication infrastructure like countries like in, in Africa and set up this banking software, then this must be. So the, this ability to create the benefit of doubt in your favor is the first step in you, you win the first battle there, right there. Your, your ability to stick to your uh, track record. And how we used some of those, will uh, I'll share with you now. Because we were from Citigroup and our parentage for, was, was from Citigroup, we really leveraged the Citigroup branding, the ability to get some of that brand sheen rubbed off onto us. For example, as a company, there were certain best practices that we learned from the Citigroup in the way we managed our employees, in the way we managed government, in the way we complied with state, federal, and international uh, uh, compliance-related issues, in the way we did our accounting, in the way we did. So everything that we did had some kind of a parent supervision from Citigroup. So that really was something that we were able to put, put both in our crisis responses as well as in our business plan. The, the second and the third thing, that, that those, the elements that really supported our narrative in those uh, getting our uh, CEO out of prison as well as fighting the backlash that came when your client stands up and says your software does not work was the ability to go and call upon the good offices of our customers. All the clients with whom we've done great work and had outstanding relationships is like, come on, man, so many years we got your back. It's time for you to step up and, and speak. And so many of our customers who are bankers, very conservative folks, who would never 
go out in public and make any kind of statement, they were the ones who rallied and, and, and supported us in that time of crisis. Both personal life as well as even in, in, in corporate life, one of the things we, we need to realize is if your track record has been consistent and strong, there will be times when there will be some crisis moments, and that's the time you can dip back into your story, into your track record, into your past credentials, and, and get yourself out of that hole. So the, the ability for us as a company to really put together a team of people who are very strong on law, who are very strong on international cultural um, nuances, our ability to work the diplomatic corridors. For example, we, we really needed the Indian government to kind of support us and get our back when we had to get this CEO out of prison, right? So Indian government at that time was really very pro-business and pro-information technology and pro-startup kind of a mindset. They really were getting our back. This, they, they really said, look, if this is the kind of treatment that Indian companies are, are going to deal with, if they come and do business, then as Indian government, we really strongly denounce it. So when Indian government made a statement, the Dutch government paid attention. We were a very small company. $650 million company is no big deal to, to Netherlands. But because the government of India made a public denunciation of this arrest that happened, the Dutch government took serious effect. The Indian High Commissioner called the Dutch Commissioner, the Dutch High Council, in, into a diplomatic meeting and asked for an explanation as to what transpired. Why did this happen? Why was not so any sufficient notice given to the Indian company? How could, so really at the highest levels, communication started happening. And then, I learned it much later, we knew that we had to ask for a big favor from the British government. Because if they want to, it, geographically, Netherlands and Britain are much closer and they have a stronger affinity to each other than India and Britain, although India and Britain also have a strong, you know, they, they ruled us for a couple of centuries, right? But because of their geographic proximity, the favor we were asking the British government of letting our guy go was going to be a no or, a, or an insult or an affront to the Dutch government. So we were really asking the British government to pull off something that they would have probably not done for a long time, or it was unprecedented. But we were able to pull that off. The reason we were able to do that, I discovered that much later, is what happens in diplomacy and international cross-cultural affairs is that they give something and they get back something. We, we discovered that much later, that a prisoner, a British prisoner who was languishing in an Indian prison for 20, 25 years, it, it's a very famous case called the Purulia Arms, where a British pilot was caught and he was languishing in a jail in India and Indian government was sitting on a request to, to provide insulin medicines, a, a request that came from the British Channel. So the Indian guy said, you know what, this request that, that's been sit, sitting with us, we'll clear this, get our guy out. It's like children, right? You give me this, I give you that. So to cut a long story short, our primary objective of getting our CEO out was done. And then we went on the offensive on why this Dutch government set out this extradition request, which impacted our businesses, which impacted our employees who were there. All the employees had to be flown back, which meant all our existing engagements with those banks for which the employees were in the first place suffered, which meant a lot of contingency planning and, and backup activity had to be done. So to cut a long story short, we really went on the offensive to find out and we dug deeper and then we discovered it was actually a disgruntled employee that we had hired who went to, to the uh, Dutch uh, uh, interior department and then just alleged about some visa misuse. See, one disgruntled employee can just bring a company to its knees. Whether it's in retail or whether it's business to business, if you're not careful, crisis can strike a corporation from anywhere. And that's why, like the Boy Scout, you have to be prepared. 
any time you're operating in any country, you've got to realize that there are some elements at risk, and then you have a crisis plan in place. So to, to kind of round up, we really had a template for every geography. For example, if Europe, there's something cooking, we would have a crisis management in, uh, in fully developed, fully rotated out. Who are the executives that we need to tap into locally and as well as back at the headquarters? We really had a fairly well thought out communication strategy in place. Having learned our lessons, those two big examples, we really, really had a, a, a time where many executives came together and said, how can we learn from this experience and come to as a brand? And we discovered that if we have to cut our losses, then there are times when you have to take the path of least resistance. So with the, with the client, we went into a remediation mediation process, and we settled because if you attack a client, you might win the battle, but you will end up losing the war. Because that will send a strong message to the other customers that they will also be in the same place should should a legal dispute come up, right? So we, we, we chose the high ground and we said, look, for all the alleged stuff that you accused us of, this is what we could do, these are the facts, and we, we went into, into a mediation process. Like same, the same thing we did with the Dutch government. In the thick of crisis, everybody said, let's sue the Dutch government, let's get them. We're trying to help their nation, we're trying to build the uh, banks in that country, let's try and do this. But as the emotions simmered and everybody cooled off, we realized that it's not as easy as it looks. Legal litigation can be a long drawn process. It can drain your company's resources. It'll drain your personal resources. People have to show up in court and people have to prepare legal counsels and so on and so forth. So even there, we tried to cut our losses and try and, because what was most important in that country was how do we resume business as usual with the banks with whom we had already contracted to implement software. Because they paid us money, we took their money and the imperative was that we go back and get back to work. So how we went, ended up closing all the conflict issues and, and got back to business as usual was also a similar uh, mindset. Get your customers back to that, things are back to normal, everything is business as usual. So. Those were some of the key lessons we, we learned during our... A few uh, tips and then I'll, I'll see if we, we are pretty much near, near the gratitude mark that I talked to you about. I personally believe, both as a professional and, and also as an individual, and, and that's what I teach to everyone who cares to listen, is truth always. Because in a crisis, our first impulse is to what? Cover up, lie. Uh, sometimes you don't do it with the intent to cheat, but to, to, to just make us look good or just to, to avoid the ignominy of, of, of the fact that we made a mistake. So if you are able to just own it up, suck it up and, and just say, yes, there is an issue, get the truth out, then it will really change uh, uh, the, the, the game about crisis, both uh, mini crisis, international crisis, any crisis, the principle is the same, truth and speed. Stakeholders care about what's being done, not so much as outcomes. As, as PR guys, we sometimes come under pressure because we are not able to give satisfying answers to all the stakeholders. Media guys would line up outside my office in Mumbai or wh wherever I was just asking for the, the most recent update. But I would find it very difficult to give them any more update than what I already have because I can't fabricate information just to satisfy them. So there would be times when I would just go back and say, sorry guys, I don't have any more information than what I told you two days ago or yesterday. Status quo, this is what it is. We've, we've put out this request and then you know it'll take time and then we just wait, we wait over. So our ability to keep the conversation going was critical to, to managing that crisis. I talked to you about how we were, some bit of sheen was taken off our brand because of those crises. 
we were scarred. Some of us were scarred. Particularly the, the family, just imagine the family uh, of the executive who, were, who was arrested. They carry that emotional scar, right? We all had emotional investment into it. In fact, the guy who, who got arrested was the very guy who hired me. So I was personally more invested in that crisis. And, and for some of us who were, who were very, it, it, it took a while for us to wrap our minds around this because who, who in their right mind would, would want to face a crisis of this magnitude? But we came through. We came through because we knew track record would bail us out. In fact, there's a very interesting story about that executive. Six months prior to his, uh, that unfortunate incident, the Prime Minister of Britain at that time, Tony Blair, came to India on a trade mission. And he had dinner with a few top up and coming young executives who were under a particular age. Around, I think it was about 45 or something. So a very famous cricketer, a very famous uh, uh, a lady dancer, some folks from the media, some folks from the business world were called to have that exclusive dinner with the Prime Minister. And an invitation was sent to our company. And it so happened that because our chairman, like I said, lived in the US, they had to depute a, a, a much younger executive. And this very guy ended up at the Tony Blair dinner. So we used that factoid that, look, if you guys put a, a person of this stature in prison and we use that photographic and other evidences to say, these are the kind of guys you put in prison. Look at the track record. He had dinner with your prime minister. So our ability to go back and dip anecdotal and other pieces of evidence to contribute to our overarching narrative was really a key element in our, uh, in our, in our success story. All the big guys were invested, right from our chairman who was sitting in the New York City office, was willing to fly to London, was willing to get to India, get in front of the diplomats and tell our story. Because if the chairman of the company is sitting in front of you and telling the story, then you have pretty much the whole voice and the, and the and the credentials of that company right in front of you. So we were able to get everybody. And then I repeat that same thing. Emotional intelligence was key in managing these inter cross-cultural dialogues. We knew that if we got very aggressive, the other party also gets aggressive. Then you'll harden your stance in the ground. And then there will be very less scope for a peaceful solution. Because conflicts like these can be long drawn. So even when you are in a crisis, in an individual crisis, you're taking on a bank, you're taking on your cell phone company, you're taking on, pick your battles. Do not invest your time in, in mindless, draining experiences. Try and see whether it's, if you can take the high road and, and just get out of those situations. Bottom line, our experience because of those two crises was that our employee base became very, very energized. They knew that. If any of those 6,000 employees ever got into a situation anywhere, the message they got was the chairman of the company and downward, everybody would come and rally to their rescue. So internal communication and internal motivation really surged after, after that, that crisis. So, so as a brand, we experienced a plethora of benefits. Particularly, we went through this, these two crises. So those two experiences really shaped our DNA as, as, a, as a company. And we're living in a very social media intense world. One tweet, anybody's account could be hacked and wrong messages could be sent, right? Your identity could be hacked and your computers, your, your phones, everything could be jammed. So, to, to bring it home, I'd like you to start thinking of what are the worst things that could happen to my telephone, my bank accounts, my reputation online, and start thinking of having a social media plan in place. Who are some of the first people whom you should be calling upon to rescue your reputation online? What are some of the things that you should stand for so that people straight away know that if some wrong messages are posted online on your account, through your account, people straight away know that it's hacked. 
you need to set up those uh, systems in place. What are some of the things you could do? Just start wrapping your mind because it's a crazy world out, out there. Just a just couple of uh, days ago in India, one of the top politicians, his account was hacked and all sorts of weird humor, all sorts of almost self-deprecatory humor was inflicted up on, uh, on the, on the twi Twitter universe. And I got to think and I said, if, if a, a big gun like him is not spared, some of us are small fry. It could happen to us like that. So start thinking about what, what you say and how, how do you want to be seen, particularly as you uh, approach employment and future uh, uh, plans uh, in mind. What if a future employer mines your social media account? What are some of the critical words that, that come out? Is your social media narrative consistent with what you want to stand for or the direction that you want to take in, in your future? So these are some of the lessons that I learned based, based on, on, on the crisis that, that I managed. And I want to be able to share that with you uh, today. And before I wrap up, I just want to take a moment uh, just so that it doesn't sound like I'm sucking up to professor. But I really want to thank you, Dr. Raza, for this wonderful opportunity. I learned a bit of public speaking from Professor Raza, who was involved in a public speaking club in Hyderabad. So if I let you down, I shouldn't be the one to be blamed. <laughs> thank you so very much. Um, I'll pause here, and we'll see if we could continue the conversation through Q&A. The mic is on, and uh, feel free. So while they are thinking of questions to ask, uh, let me ask you the first question, Mr. Robert, uh, which is that uh, today is, what is your understanding of how social media amplifies a crisis? And in fact, let me ask you, does it amplify a crisis? Because at one level, it is clear that something you know, gets retweeted and retweeted a million times. But because of social media being uh, intense as it is, sometimes uh, the cycle shortens. So do you recommend that if there is something particularly egregious that hits you, uh, should you just wait it out? That is one. And the second thing is that, you know, you are being very scrupulous and honest about these things and you say truth first. But uh, are there any benefits to sort of deflecting this crisis by, you know, doing something else and, you know, taking the attention elsewhere? I mean, purely as a strategy, I want sure. to ask. Thank you for those two questions. I'll <clears throat> answer the, the, the first question about whether social media kind of amplifies and and makes, um, um, because of the, the whole cycle of, of just going viral is, is, is the way news is being consumed. For example, the earlier during the pre-social media revolution, people used to wait till the next day's newspaper or the next evening's news bulletin or something, which meant the corporations had some time to respond before they could manage the crisis. But because of the social media, the crises are almost played out real time, which means the, you know, the, 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 the dominant rule in social media is people don't let uh, facts interfere with the conversation. People really don't have the time to wait for the facts. In fact, the moment people start posting things as, as status or, or tweeting and retweeting, one of the things that we need to do is go and do a fact check, a, a, a verified on, on either any sites or, or some credible sites where this kind of, at least you know it is, it is not just somebody's vicious propaganda that's just starting out. Now, if I'm a bank, if, if I'm a, a company where my employees are there, the first thing that we need to check out is what is the way we can respond officially first and then just see if you could watch out the narrative. And this is where I just want to uh, 
uh, talk to you about how do how do we use our strategy of deflection and and what I've learned in all these crises and as a as a company what I've discovered is if you if a, if a journalist or some kind of a reporter or someone asked me for a response and I deflected it my credibility suffers if I then I will not have the leverage to because it's a two-way street when I need to sell a story to a media the currency that I'll be using is my own trust then you say the last time you played me why should I believe you right so deflecting can buy the corporation some time so there are merits in the way you you start talking about your it's a great strategy when you don't have the full facts around you let's say some a reporter calls me and starts asking me hey is it true that your software in brazil is completely destroyed the the top two banks and uh, you know thousands of atms are locked down the brazilians are struggling they are I, I could pretty much use that deflection as a strategy at that time because I don't have the full facts with me. So I could just say, hey, look, in Latin America, this is my track record. I deflect it to our, uh, our, our track record and say we're serving about 12 countries in, across the re region. These are the X number of customers. I provide them information. In the meantime, I go back and get my facts right. And if I try to get my facts from social media, that's where I, I'll be making a mistake because I'm going into a wrong place to get my facts. My immediate facts have to be, where are, where are the crisis points emerging from? In fact, the, the military has a nice uh, uh, acronym for uh, crisis, the VUCA, V-U-C-A. Volatility, uncertainty, anyone know that? All right, look it up, I just gave you two, you can look up the other two, V-U-C-A. Volatility, uncertainty, then there's you look up the other two. So these four elements constitute what is a crisis. Now, if the situation is volatile, then deflection is a great idea because it's changing. The, you, you can't say something and then we discover, discover that what you said does not hold meaning anymore because the crisis and its dimensions have changed. Is it a, is it a, is it a crisis that, that plays out again and again, right? Uh, if, if some, somebody, uh, if you take on this banking and software kind of a thing, what if somebody has injected a virus that can actually impact in another country? So there's that uncertainty as well. So it, it plays out in different dimensions. So to just recap my answer, deflection is a great strategy when you don't have the full information uh, at your disposal. And this, uh, the earlier question was, social media is a really vicious uh, place to be. And which is why I, truth finally triumphs, always triumphs. You need to come here, man, please. I just had a question about you personally. The software that you were designing for these companies, what purpose did they hold within the company? It's a software that will help them with their internet banking, uh, payments. It's, it's like the core of, of, of that uh, bank. So like uh, FIS? It's a bit like FIS, like Fiserv, Jack Henry, yes. Oh, okay. So we were the first to come from India. Oh. And, and because these guys were so so long in the banking industry, we just came like a new company and, and created this banking software and then that really helped us succeed globally. Okay. That's a great question. Mr. Sunil, uh, good evening, Raphael. Question, your first incident, um, after you acknowledged you, the situation with your CEO who was in jail, how did you resolve the situation? What were the necessary steps? Like, summarize the steps for me. You said you acknowledged it, you didn't admit guilt, you had to get your CEO out, but you had to yeah. release a public statement. So how do you solve that problem? Yeah. You know, I alluded to a, a, mis a set of unfortunate circumstances. You know, in a situation like when, when you, uh, uh, in an in particularly when you're living in a foreign country, the first thing you should do is just deposit your passport and say, look, I'm gonna be around, don't arrest me. Which should have been the appropriate response for our executive at that time, right? 
But unfortunately, his passport was in the United States Embassy because he had applied for a US visa. So what would the opponent think? That he's trying to flee the country because he is guilty. So that unfortunate fact that he did not have the passport with him really led to this arrest. Otherwise, it could have been just treated like a white collar, um, um, a violation, just through the diplomatic channels, it could have been resolved. But because he was in, um, he ended up in prison, so the first challenge was to get him out. So we went, applied through, through the uh, diplomatic uh, channels as well as the trade channels. We again spoke about how India is contributing to Britain and therefore Indian trade British trade will get affected. So they saw the big picture, and they got him out of, of, of that. So that was the first thing. Then we, we assured them that he will stay in Britain. He will cooperate with the British authorities. And we refused to go to Netherlands. Because we were not sure if he went to Netherlands, the right channels and the right processes would be followed. So our second battle was to get Britain to deny the extradition request, to keep him in Britain itself. So that was the second battle. Yeah. You have experience in marketing. You didn't have any previous legal experience. So how did, how far did you go to learning about the law uh, and the, the process and stuff like this? Did you call a specialist, obviously lawyer or whatever? Right. Did, how, how, how much hands-on were you? That's a great question. I, I was purely managing the PR, media, and the uh, international affairs part. I had a, a couple of senior uh, colleagues who were working, who were managing the big picture from a legal standpoint, what messaging because we didn't want to say anything that would you know, harden the stance of the Brits or the Dutch and, and so on. So every message had to be vetted both legally in India as well as in the United States where our parent company was. And we had international uh, trade experts in London helping us out. And so our messaging had to be vetted by, by these folks. Often it was very draining because our immediate impulse was to act or just, just respond and, and but the ability to pull back your emotions to make sure that the messaging passes through the filter of legal compliance uh, and international affairs lenses helped us to, to really discipline ourselves when we, when we were handling such a difficult and the emotional um, topic. So it, it was a first for us, um, and uh, we literally grew through this whole experience. And yes, we had to hire some international, very high-level attorneys in, in London and, and in India just to walk us through this process. So you mentioned that if you don't know um, information in order to save yourself, that you kind of beat around the bush while you get that information, what would you suggest to do if once you get that information, it doesn't benefit you and what you know, they were saying about you is true. What would you, how would you go about it? Would you still be truthful? Would you still say, yeah, I did that? Or would you kind of, because you, you said always tell the truth. Right. So, so how would that work? It's, it's, it's a gr great question. Uh, what, what do I stand for? What do I stand for? Do I want to be known as a person who, even when confronted with like compelling evidence, still not accept. You know, we have many uh, experiences and examples of people who tried to play around with words and say, you know, I almost did that. I didn't. So when in doubt, it, I, I, this is my personal experience. When in doubt, just, just be the, the person who is willing to take, oh, I'm sorry you felt that way, but this is what I thought. And always explain your stance, explain your perspective. And this is where your track record comes in. If you've always been a kind of a person who was very dodgy or who was like almost at the on the borderline and and you know, then then your track record catches up. You know, the world will never judge you on one instance. If it is the first time, there's you get a lot of currency for being the first time. I mean, even in a in a how many of you had the first traffic violation ever? A couple of you, right? If it is a first violation, you go in front of a judge and you plead the first time you get away, right? Yes or no? There is, there is clemency the first time. But after a while, if, if it's the second or third instance, 
the track record is speaking. You cannot lead clemency at that time. Yes or no? So you, you'd be judged on a series of incidents and uh, 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 your, your overall narrative than just one standoff, one, one standalone incident. So you, it really comes down to what narrative do you want to live by? Um, disgruntled employee, that situation, um, did that ever threat of legal action ever cross your mind because you guys were going to you know, make a lot of money, your IPO? Did that, the threat of you know, cease and desist as far as them spreading any, how long did it take you to get to the bottom of that, 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 that situation right there? And then you guys threaten legal action to, you know, because they're messing up your money. So. Sure. This actually happened in the second instance where I, I talked about the Dutch extradition request where they thought we were misusing the visa rules and provisions. So once we discovered that it, it stemmed from there, we actually went and told all our customers that this is a result of what happened. Because that's the truth. You know, the, the thing about truth is you can tell it as is. So we, we told our customers the truth. By then, that employee was already fired. So there wasn't much we could do because that employee was already fired. I mean, if, if he was still in the payroll and something, we could have discipline or there could have been some in, in, impact. But he, he was already uh, a, a disgruntled employee who left, who was fired. So there wasn't much we could do. But what we did go and talk in the Dutch media and to the Dutch uh, trade uh, representatives was the damage done to our brand. And once we kind of repaired and business as usual went on, we, we saw that even they realized that they acted in haste and caused immeasurable damage to us. Oh, some of the lessons we learned was the the ability to tightly manage information within a very closed set of people, the the ability to communicate to employees just just the amount that they need to know, the ability to make sure that employees do not have any access to any information beyond this, the scope of their duty. Some of those are clearly defined in, in, in companies now. For example, if you, you, let's say you go to India and you walk into some of our software factories, you, you wouldn't be able to use your phones to take a selfie or, or any such thing. Why? Because some of the work that is being done is on behalf of some top banks top airline companies, top retail corporations around the world. So even if in, inadvertently, in the selfie, a screenshot of a computer that on which some work is coming, that employee could potentially lose his job just, just for taking a selfie. So strict protocols are in place the way man, employees are managed in, in, in today's world. For example, there are, there are a lot of bring your own device policies where you, you're allowed to take just just a, a phone and an iPad, but you cannot take your MacBook or you cannot take your t to work. And even if there are some, th th there are places where your USB drives, most laptops that are given, their USB drives are disabled because you cannot copy information. And if anyone is sending any information to their private email account from the company's systems, it's flagged. So today's technology allows you to monitor really at a very intense level what emails you might be sending. This, just the subject and, and also just a few search phrases, we could mine what emails are, are going out of, of their system. In a sense, because when you sign up on, to work on behalf of a corporation, you are privy to that company's uh, intellectual property. So you sign for it. Okay, uh, 
Sunil, let me ask you one final question because you have shown us the interface between the organization and the person. So it is great that, you know, we should uh, make sure that we are not really doing anything ridiculous on our social media and so on and so forth. What would you recommend once uh, a student of mine had graduated and I wanted to get in touch with him and I uh, googled him and the first thing that came up was a mugshot, an arrest mugshot. And I was, anyway, I managed to reach him and I said, you know that this is what comes up and he says, I've been very distressed about it. I was arrested uh, on, I mean, what he told me was they were fabricated charges and the charges were subsequently dropped, but that damn thing keeps coming up. So, uh, you know, present company excluded, but people who grew up at that point in time and social media was just coming, early 90s, so on and so forth, which is our demographic, have sometimes messed up. What is your, do you have any practical suggestions for them? And with that, we'll close. Go ahead. Like I said, the digital imprint stays forever. You, any, any post, any tweet, any, any, any verbal battles that you get into with, with folks on Facebook or something, they'll stay forever. And if, if you're applying for a corporation or, or a company where the HR folks or the legal folks, or some of you might want to consider public service, you're, you're trying to get into a public office at some point, some of these will come back. And a uh, couple of uh, months ago, at the end of August, we, I was in Washington, D.C., attending a meeting, and we met a couple of people who were specifically hired. They are legal and uh, technology people who were hired to screen and do intel on people whom the White House and, and some of these congr congressmen, other people on the Capitol Hill, they were hiring. So vetting today is so intense that you really want to be extra careful about, I'm not saying you shouldn't speak your convictions. If, like I was talking to you about uh, earlier on, about you are judged by your convictions, beliefs, actions, track record, the whole picture. But oftentimes, indiscretions, like Professor was talking about, it was, it was an unfortunate case where it was, so for example, for similar situations such as that, he really has to take legal help to get that, try and get that print out, or even just get that updated to saying this was fabricated. Uh, this. So some bit of, uh, just like in the newspaper world, when in the heat of the moment, re reporters file stories, but then they add addendums later to say, this story is updated to reflect this fact, right? So some bit of digital correction can be done, particularly if, if, if you've, uh, you've posted something, blogged something, and, and you, you have a different perspective. There are some remedial works that you, you could do. But like I always say, if the, in Toastmasters, to wrap up my uh, conclusion, in Toastmasters, the rule is there are three topics that you try to stay away from, religion, sex, and politics. <laughs> right? Because on these three topics, Pretty much everyone has a strong opinion. So depends on how you want to uh, conduct the dialogue in, in a particularly public forum. Now, I can imagine if it's a closed door, if it's a different room, if you're messaging one-on-one, -on -one, it's, it's private. But if you, if you are just leaving something out there for the world to see, it has to really reflect who you are and what you stand for. And you're willing to defend it tooth and nail Till, till your last drop. And if those are your convictions, by all means, there are some convictions like I shared today, I'm willing to stand up and defend those till the cows come home. But if they're not your convictions and you don't stand by them, then, then you've, you've, you've done a Walter of us, all right? Thanks a lot, you've been a wonderful audience and I really appreciate you. Thank you.